All right, welcome everybody to How to Boost Your Immune System During Cold and Flu Season. I am Dr. Patrick Callis, MD, uh, reporting to you in, from uh, Commercial Drive in Vancouver uh, in a little office here during these strange, strange end of year 2020 times. So uh, we're gonna talk about how to boost up your immune system and uh, a little bit about me. I've been a practicing naturopathic doctor for over eight years. I used to have my own clinic on Salt Spring Island called Island Natural Health that I founded and ran successfully for just about five years. And then my family and I decided to move back to Vancouver so I could teach and just to pursue other opportunities and another great MD is running my clinic there named Brad Dunstan MD, which I get to pop into see time to time as my parents live on the island and looking forward to seeing them again, although not this Christmas with travel restrictions, but we'll see them virtually. It's uh, sure a lot of people are in similar boats this year, it's been an odd one. So here's to, here's to improving our immune function and getting this uh, pandemic under wraps. Um, my area of focus as a naturopathic doctor uh, when I was on the island is a family practice, uh, but I have a special focus in cancer care and uh, uh, mental health. So anxiety and depression, which uh, for anyone tuning in next week or who would like to tune in next week, I'm doing a talk same time, 1 p.m. on uh, stress and anxiety as my next uh, speaker piece, which is a, a near and dear topic to me because I myself I went through some pretty significant, significant anxiety uh, in my teens and early 20s. And I uh, can say that I've, uh, aside from moments, I've never had as significant or as on, uh, ongoing anxiety as I have since then. So hopefully uh, those who tune in can learn some tips on how to resolve and improve anxiety, which is certainly a uh, higher of these in recent times here. Uh, so without further ado, let's dive into the presentation. We'll le I'll leave, leave time for questions and answers at the end. I'm gonna be kind of running through this. So uh, forgive the slightly dizzying pace. I'm using an app called Prezi, which uh, it moves a bit. So uh, hold on tight if you get motion sickness. We're going to be moving through uh, the presentation on how to boost up our immune system. So a little summary here. Homer's having to think about it. Uh, we're going to talk about two different types of immunity, barriers to remove, remove uh, to improve your immunity. It's always where we want to start naturopathic medicine. We want to remove the barriers. You know, if you're living in a moldy house, for instance, uh, getting the mold out is really a key thing to do uh, before taking other treatments uh, for, for the said mold. I will be mentioning mold toxins as one of these barriers as a, a spoiler alert that's already happened. Uh, then we're going to talk about how hormones tie into immunity. Uh, then we're going to look at how to build a strong immune system, followed by remedies for colds and flus. And finally, some herbs and foods you can probably have at home or can easily get at home uh, just to add into your arsenal and use when you have a cold or flu. Or if you're stuck at home and can't get out to get a remedy right away, these are things you can take. And then we'll do some questions and answers. Conflicts of interest. I don't really have any. I was previously and very proudly a speaker for Purica uh, Wellness, which is a company out of Duncan. I think they're great. I spoke for them. Uh, only because I thought they're fantastic and I love the remedies they do. I do mention one of the remedies, uh, but I've kept the remedy recommendations otherwise very generic. If, you know, um, there's one unique remedy that we'll talk about for an acute, uh, acute remedies uh, from Purica. Uh, but to be clear, I don't get paid anything by Purica. I haven't been a paid speaker for, I think, about two years. But if you do Google me, you'll see as a video shows there, me speaking for Purica. That was a particularly funny video shoot where we just keep stopping because the helicopters kept landing. Uh, <laughs> The Vancouver Harbor. Anyway, um, I love educating. I am uh, a, t a teacher for the Boucher Institute of Naturopathic Medicine. I used to work teach in the classroom. Now I mainly teach clinical interns, clinical skills. Uh, in the last couple of years, I've actually done uh, some clinical uh, teaching uh, at my clinic space for uh, UBC Pharmacology as well. I do actually have a prescriptive license, um, but that wasn't the reason why they were sending their interns to me to be taught. It was to uh, so they have an in innovative program there where they send interns to integrative uh, clinics so we can do collaborative work, which is wonderful. It's great to see the medical system is shifting that way and it's lots to learn and share from both friends. Anyway, on to the topics. So first, let's talk about types of immunity. This is just a really brief bit of, neuro a bit of an, uh, uh, you know, immunology for us all. <laughs> Uh, there are two main types of immunity. First one, oh, that's going the wrong order, sorry. I did problem shoot this and apparently it's not playing nice. Whatever. So skill testing question, where is your immune system? The spoiler alert there is it's 
in your gall. That's your digestive tract. Your gut associated lymphatic tissue is where about 60 to 80% of your immune tissue lies. So you'll see why that's important later when we're talking about digestion. But if you consider your immune system a little bit like a, uh, a police force, uh, the police station is in your guts. So that's where the headquarters is. And so that's why gut health is so crucial, so, so crucial underlying exclamation mark to immune health because a lot of immune tissue is there and it's, it's testing the environment and it's developing responses to the environment. And as you probably all know, uh, we have trillions of bacteria uh, and even some fungus, mold and parasites that live in our gut in, in, a, in a balance and they're really essential to us. Your fun fact uh, of the moment is the bacteria in your gut, if you just took out the gut bacteria in your intestines and you put it on a scale, it would weigh more than your liver and it actually does as much if not more than your liver and your liver does a, thousands of tasks for you. It's a really hardworking multitasking organ. So those bacteria are crucial to us uh, for immunity and so much more. Uh, which is a whole talking to itself, but uh, just saying good immune function is partly good gut function as well. And it makes sense to immune system to be there because when we're eating, uh, as weird as it sounds sometimes to hear that our mouth or our anus is, is all the outside world just passing through us in a tube. And so that interface, when it gets thin, where we're absorbing food and nutrients into the bloodstream is where we want to have lots of immune surveillance and, and checking because, you know, we want food to get and nutrients to get in, but we have to be very careful. We're not letting in bacteria, viruses, and other things into our bloodstream of that thin barrier in our small intestines. So the two types of immunity, just really briefly, is what we call innate immunity. That's the first line of defense. It's how is your skin intact? You know, if you get cut, you're introducing possible pathogens. That's why you want to take care of injuries. But also in our immune system, we have white blood cells that are part of our immune system and they have the innate function in the sense that they have something called neutrophils and natural killer cells. Um, the body's never quite so simple. Natural killer cells or NK cells actually are somewhat adaptive. Um, but we'll see the other part of the white blood cell system in a second that is actually a learned part of the immune system or adaptive. Stomach acid, gut bacteria, those are all in, innate. All it means, it's like the moat in the castle wall. If you think your body has a castle, these are things that are just always there and they, they're intact and functioning and they don't need to be trained to do what they do. They just do it as a matter of defense. So think of this as again, moat, castle wall, soldiers uh, in your immune system. The other part of our immune system is adaptive immunity. This is where we get antibodies. Um, and this is where T cells and B cells that are part of our white blood cells uh, are being produced and they respond pr to a previous infection or adaptively over time. They're not a quick response because it has, has to be learned. And this is where things like vaccines, which is not a topic we're getting can get into today, um, play a role, right? If you expose your system to um, a virus or bacteria and it responds appropriately, then in part of its set response later on uh, will be to have antibodies that can defend you. So we want both these systems working well. Obviously we want to stop. Instead of having these sort of secret specialized police force of adaptive immunity, we want the outer walls, uh, moat and, and general, you know, soldiers on the wall to be working well. And uh, just to this points out innate immune system, they don't can take hours to respond to uh, an invader versus it takes days with adaptive. So we want both working well. Um, but, you know, right now, what we want, if we've never been exposed to something, say like COVID, then we want our innate immune system working very well. Uh, so we want to treat, treat it well, and we're going to talk about that in a second here. So the first thing, piece of cure, you know, if you're not acutely sick right now, we're looking at prevention. But even if you are sick, this is something to, to put in, in your hat as a consideration, is we want to remove barriers to cure here or obstacles your immune system being optimal or well. So we're gonna shoot through all these topics kind of quickly um, and we'll uh, you know, have, you know, fire off questions and uh, I will answer them at the end of the talk. And I'll leave lots, at least 15 minutes, if not more to do that. So stress plays a really huge role in our immune system. Uh, cortisol is what we call the stress hormone. It's not the only hormone that responds to stress, but it's an easy one to chat about. Cortisol, if you see that, orange curve, it's meant to rise up from morning to the afternoon and cortisol wakes us up. If you have a normal cortisol level, you're ready to get jump out of bed. If you're someone who's dragging yourself out of bed, your cortisol level is probably not normal when you're getting up. Uh, there are different chronotypes as a side topic, meaning that some people truly are 
adapted and have a biorhythm where they're meant to wake in the morning, whereas some of us are actually more late morning and our energy rises by evening. Most of us sit somewhere in the middle, um, but there are really, you know, the morning, the morning forks or the larks uh, and the night owls. Uh, well, most of us are adaptive in the middle. And cortisol is playing a major role in driving that energy metabolism. So here, when stress is high all the time, that's where we have a problem. We're adapted as human beings to acute stress. It's not to say it won't take its toll if it's you know, big enough stress, traumatic, uh, or ongoing for days. Um, but when it, the stress keeps going on for weeks and months and we, we're not adapting or we're not kind of letting it go and letting the system reset, that's where we get into trouble and where term adrenal fatigue comes up. Now, a lot of medical doctors will criticize the term adrenal fatigue because it's a bit inaccurate. Um, the actual term, the medical term, what we'd be referring to there is um, would be uh, more of an adrenal dysfunction, uh, has to do with not just adrenal glands that produce cortisol and our stress hormones and our sex hormones and regulate our blood pressure, um, but it actually has to do with our brain as well. So the, the term for what was once called adrenal fatigue, which is a common term for just sort of like burnout or a somewhat medical term for burnout, um, is actually called a, a hypopituitary axis dysfunction or HPA axis dysfunction. Uh, which is a topic into itself as well, but the long and the short of it is if you have ongoing stress that you're not regulating well over long periods of time, you start to become adapted to you, your cortisol, like a, a, a diabetic becomes adapted to their insulin level, they start to become insensitive to it, and we can become insensitive to cortisol that's running high all the time, and that's when we start to feel exhausted, where energy is constantly low, we crave sugar, and when little things stress us out, instead of having kind of what we consider a normal emotional response, we get really you can, some people go withdraw or freeze completely, or some people, you can get really frustrated or angry. I always call it, it's like Hulk mode, right? You like knock over a cup and all of a sudden you're raging, especially at the end of the day, or you've been under a lot of stress. That is a sign that your cortisol is not at a normal level. It's, it's being, you become insensitive to it, or it's, it's, you know, you're a little bit out of regulation or balance in that, you know, what would look like a normal orange curve there, and it needs to be regulated back. So um, that'd be something that we want to do to improve immunity. We want to re-regulate that stress. And I go into this because it's such a big part and there's so much stress going on. And again, it's that chronic stress that we want to help regulate. And so some of the remedies I'll talk about are not just for immunity, they are for regulating stress. Because if we're going to choose a natural remedy or any remedy, pick one that does multitask. Pick something that's going to check all the boxes or as many as you can for you, because I find it overwhelming, you know, um, unless there's an acute reason, right? If I've got a flu, I'll, I'll be taking more than one supplement. But, you know, it's great if I can just take one thing or th two things or three things instead of like 18 things. I've had patients come in who I just literally have a basket. I've literally had people come in with like the Robin, the, the like the picnic basket full of supplements and they're overwhelmed. They're like, what should I take? And I'm like, that's too much. I feel stressed out just looking at it. I'm kidding a little bit, but I, I will literally some visits help pare things down to get really uh, honed into what that person is doing. And it's not all about supplements. You know, stress is about regulating stress is about smiling and laughing and social contact, even if it has to be digitally these days um, or in your own bubble. Um, regular exercise and even other stressors, short term stressors like exposure to cold can actually have a huge benefit. Uh, deep breathing or breathing practice. Uh, can play a huge role in regulating the system um, to have a normal curve. Sorry, and I've been saying a regular curve is, is orange. Apologies, you're going like, what's he talking about? Uh, uh, the blue is the normal curve here, uh, and uh, the regular curve is orange. We're meant to have an, an energy or a cortisol that rises up in the morning, so we're ready to go, or by later in the morning, depending on your chronotype. And then, uh, and then goes down. But if you've had prolonged ongoing stress, it starts to shift that curve, and this is where you can't go to sleep at night, you feel wired but tired, you're exhausted all the time. Um, and, then, and then eventually that can go to more of a, almost a flat line or a flatter curve. And while testing can be done for cortisol levels, it's really how you're feeling, what's your energy during the day, how do you feel after meals? Those are all good indicators of what your cortisol is doing. If you crave a lot of sugar, it's a sign your cortisol is probably running out of balance and your blood sugar, because they both go hand in hand. Uh, under stress, the, the response is to release more cortisol, and that tells us to get more sugar into our bloodstream because it thinks we want to fight or flee, which is not often appropriate or really what we need to do in most, uh, you know, work work a day worlds or relationship stresses. Uh, so adapting to that is really important. Poor sleep has a huge impact on immunity as well. Uh, just listing a few things there you could read out, you know, things like a regular bedtime or a late bedtime. I know some of us, if you work late, and you have to work late because it's part of your job, then 
then that's you know uh, something you can't really get around uh, necessarily. But you know, the, there is certainly value in getting sleep um, before midnight. You know, I always somewhat as dramatically will say, you know, consider this hours you get of sleep before midnight is twice as valuable to you. Uh, and if you can get them, that's so, so important. Because um, we're, we're meant to rise up with the light and go to bed with dark. It's one of those bizarre things that where our world maintains the same work hours throughout the year. It's kind of cruel because we're not really, we've not, we didn't evolve that way. We, we really should have shorter work hours when winter time comes. Uh, not to say we have to fully follow that rhythm, but it just it is, we are fighting our own natural rhythms of sunshine and energy when we're doing that. Uh, screen time before bed, that's one I struggle with a bit, um, but you know, if you can't avoid uh, your phone completely or a computer completely or a TV completely a couple hours before bedtime, then uh, one thing you could do is, uh, um, you know, if it's a screen like a computer or a tablet or your phone, you can turn it to a dark mode or you can turn it to a screensaver mode where it takes out the blue light because the blue light is the most stimulating thing. On your computer, you can get a free application called Flux, F-L-U-X. Uh, that can take that out. You can set a timer so it does that, and that does help. Still better not to get the screen time at all, but if you take the blue light out, it won't be telling your brain that it's daytime and, and messing around with your melatonin levels, which we're going to talk about soon. Uh, don't work in bed. Bed's only for sleep, playtime, and sexy times. If you want to build a fort there, that's cool too, but try not to do any work in your bed. It's just a bad association that's going to trigger stress. Um, and yeah, so don't do that as someone who used to do that when I was in school, just as comfy sitting there. Uh, eating too late, uh, again, preferably four hours before you go to bed, no food, but certainly within two hours. And if you can't help it uh, for now, A, probably should look at your blood sugar levels in a long, as a longer term project, but in the short term, uh, carbohydrate rich foods are better than because they're quickly absorbed. They're not going to be sitting in your digestive tract like a fatty or proteinous food, high fat or high protein food. And uh, digesting uh, fully, and, you know, and if you do want something that's a little more filling but easy to digest, and you know, this is where like a protein drink before bed can be very helpful. It actually can provide the proteins or amino acids to help build sleep hormones and repair the body, and it actually can help with sleep because it's already broken up. So something like hydrolyzed whey or or a good vegan protein could be a good way to go uh, if you're hungry in the evening after dinner time. Because uh, we want our digestive tract to be resting so our body can do its other repair features in sleep appropriately because that's what we do during sleep. Uh, we repair and boost things like our immune system, we repair, repair muscles that we've worked hard during the day and so forth. Uh, heartburn and indigestion can interrupt sleep so that's a whole other thing that should be addressed uh, and uh, if anyone's here is taking things like proton pump inhibitors or Tums a lot to deal with your heartburn, then come see an ND like myself because we can resolve that. They're not a good long-term solution. They're only a short-term band-aid that we do not want sitting in place because that's a sign that your digestion needs some, you know, some support and some care. And uh, I will do another talk on that soon. Alcohol before bedtime interferes with sleep quality, therefore interferes with immunity. Um, sleeping medications, although if you're in a pinch and you're really not sleeping for days or weeks on end, they help, but they do not, they, all common sleeping medications interfere with deepest REM or high quality sleep. So they're better than nothing, but they're not as good as true deep sleep. Uh, so you don't want to be on them too long, like things like Zofaclone. I've seen patients on for years and years, and they're not getting quality sleep over that time. So it's something we want to look at natural ways to get you back in a good rhythm as you're sleeping. And a low progesterone, even in men, although it's sort of thought of as a female hormone, um, progesterone levels, if they're low, can interfere with sleep. And uh, giving progesterone can be very, very helpful in men and women, believe it or not, for a short period of time. So we're going to pick up the pace a little bit here. Poor nutrition has a big impact on the immune system. Things that are white and refined. Uh, if you're eating a lot of sugars and flours, they're white and refined. Uh, I would reduce or remove those because they are going to interfere for a period of hours after eating them with your immune system. Processed foods and certainly things like pesticides in non-organic foods all are immune irritants or suppressants. Um, which I'll talk about in more, a little more detail later. And then you can strengthen by some of the things as a sneak peek of what we're going to talk about with vitamins rich foods, mineral rich foods, and fermented foods, which we'll get into. And there's Cookie Monster. Om nom nom nom, eating his refined flour and sugar cookies. These are all signs of poor digestion. You can read them, but essentially, if you're getting any kind of upset, gas, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, if you're really hungry after 
or, or really tired after meals or can't satiate your appetite, those are all signs digestion needs some improving. And as we talked about earlier, uh, when I was mucking around with my slides there, that is where a majority of your immune tissue lies. So we want to take real good care of our digestion because it's so intimately linked to our immune system. And I personally see when there's digestive upset, even minorly, uh, in people uh, that, that immunity can, can in some people be interfered with. Uh, and, and, you know, worst case scenario and bad enough to adjust and long enough has a higher risk of autoimmune conditions because of its link to the immune system. It's not to say that it will necessarily lead there, but there's just a higher risk. Uh, and inversely, if you have any autoimmune conditions yourself or know anyone who does, improving digestion can control and significantly improve uh, autoimmune conditions in a lot of people. Uh, and gut bacteria, then the lower left there, a uh, picture of your gut bacteria, as we talked about earlier, is really important. Uh, we want the good ones and not the bad ones there uh, in any good balance. Consider it like a, a city. We want lots of good tenants and not too many of the bad tenants in there. And that's what uh, good bacteria are like. We want lots of them in place, which again, a greater topic into itself. And um, we'll talk a little bit some strategies for that as we go. Excuse me. Toxins. We want to avoid things like pesticides, which we already mentioned there. Things like Roundup Ready, which are sprayed onto. Um, I heard estimates that like 70, 80 percent of non-organic crops in the U.S., uh, at least you know, highly sprayed crops like soy, etc., will have some Roundup on it. And it's it's not that you're getting a large amount. You know, I always don't. If you're out and you can't, if you're like, I could get this non-organic apple or uh, this chocolate bar because there's no, no organic apples available, it's not the apple. Uh, and it's not a huge amount of pesticides, it's the amount we're eating. It's again, like a, excuse the crude anal uh, analogy, but death by a thousand cuts. You know, if we're eating pesticide covered food all the time. That's something we wanna be aware of because Roundup itself and other pesticides uh, are an have an antibiotic effect on the body. So they disrupt our good bacteria. That's why the good bacteria appears on this page again. Literally in the agricultural industry, Roundup is classified as an antibiotic, so it's no mystery. And it's a huge problem um, that links into immune dysfunction and other illnesses, uh, including potentially increased cancer risk based on some data out of the US that Dr. Zach Bush uh, presents uh, and his team, um, which is a really wonderful MD from the US who's quite integrative. Uh, heavy metals, things like lead, mercury, and arsenic, we all get ongoing exposure from air, water, and food, the biggest risk there um, that I see usually is, is big migratory fish. So things like tuna and swordfish are really rich in mercury. So you'd wanna avoid those. And I still do suggest eating fish, just small fish like sardines, um, mackerel, uh, and even local fish like salmon and trout are pretty low in mercury and other toxins. But something you wanna be aware of, um, if you're having a lot of immune problems, heavy metals may be one thing to investigate because I have seen chronic infections, particularly yeast infections linked to high mercury levels and only when we discovered the mercury was a problem and removed it did those yeast infections for instance uh, or sinus infections stop occurring in a few of my patients uh, which links into mold toxins we live in the damp coast um, there's lots of mold black mold is too too common i've had a few patients who un, uh, discovered after months of living in places that they had black mold which can be quite toxic uh, and it can have not uh, ongoing effects in, in suppressing the immune system in the respiratory system and it's just not a good thing to be in place there so if you've been exposed or suspect any exposure uh, testing is a really good idea a sign of mold and it's a curious one but any, if you know yourself or you know anyone who's really sensitive like you're just sensitive to everything any medication any supplement or have become sensitive, that can be a sign of mold toxicity, even if exposure some years ago, because the system can be overwhelmed by it. A really interesting topic. But again, if you're just, if someone who seems to be sensitive to everything and anything or has become one, I would strongly consider investigating mold, which means both investigating your living space um, and uh, doing a urinary mold test to, uh, to see if you're getting mold toxins, because getting them out can make a huge difference and it can be life-changing for some people. Indirectly, antibiotics, which is why I mentioned Roundup. It's not to say that the right use at the right time for a bacterial infection is a good idea, but we've overused the antibiotics, unfortunately. And they certainly have a huge impact in decimating our gut flora. It doesn't discriminate between good or bad in our gut, so it has a real mess. So if you're taking antibiotics, make sure you get probiotics afterwards in a really big dose and dietarily ongoing to help rebalance that system. And if you've had a lot of antibiotics as a child ongoingly, 
um, you probably will need probiotics in pretty big doses, both dietarily and or supplementally ongoing to help keep a good balance. Because sometimes the system just gets really thrown off uh, in a very long-term way. So we want to limit or avoid them. And, and unfortunately now we've reached a point where every antibiotic now has some resistant bacteria to it, which is bad news, but good news because you're here and we're learning ways to bolster our immune system. So we don't need antibiotics except when really necessary. And certainly for viral infections, like our uh, COVID virus there, uh, antibiotics, uh, hopefully you all know, but I'll say anyway, are completely useless because they only affect bacteria. And that's one of the reasons we, one way as humans, we've overused antibiotics. The other way has been putting them in too much cattle and feed and, and um, overusing it that way. Because we, you know, for farmers uh, in industrial systems that have not treated their animals uh, humanely uh, have overused these uh, for various reasons, which I won't go into now. Uh, stomach acid medications long-term can also interfere with immunity because they suppress your ability to absorb certain minerals, which we'll see are really important for the immune system. So again, short-term, fine, but if you're getting a lot of heartburn and you keep, need to keep taking medications, even tons, ongoingly for months, that's something you need to fix because it's going to ca ca cause downstream effects, including immune problems. Um, and then acetaminophen indirectly or too much Tylenol. It's not to say if you have a high fever, don't take it as needed, but uh, long-term higher dose use can have an impact on the immune system because it has an impact on the liver. So that's an indirect one, more minor, but something to be aware of. There's their antibiotics, affect the gut bacteria. Whew, almost through these barriers. Finally, chronic infections, that image there, um, if you're not familiar with it, that is an engorged nymph tick. That is a tick. I remember look, seeing rats at my house, uh, not in my house, but on the property, just going through rock piles when I was in Salt Spring. And I thought they had uh, tumors on them, rats and voles and little rodents. And I realized afterwards it was ticks. Yay, engorged nymph ticks. They can increase their body size by, don't quote me on this, but I think it's like 10 or 20 times. So it's enormous, so like a water balloon. Anyway, something we need to be aware of here on the West Coast, we certainly do have ticks and uh, some of them will carry Lyme and other tick-borne illnesses, which can be a massive problem because it's it can be like the itch that's not that your body can't scratch and symptoms can vary from mild to very severe. Um, uh, and that's a whole nother talk. I actually do about a 90 to two hour talk on, on Lyme and to foreign illnesses, that's something I treat a lot of is chronic infections as well. So uh, that's something we want to keep keep an eye on or be aware of. If you have any expo known exposure or live in areas with a lot of ticks, um, that's something that you may want to investigate. Um, tick Lyme disease is known as the great pretender. It can fear as a lot of other illnesses. Uh, there's even some suggestion that multiple sclerosis, sclerosis or MS may be, in some amount of cases, may be caused by a misdiagnosis and caused by um, Lyme disease or some of the tick-borne infections. So something to keep in mind if you're, anyone you know has MS, you may actually not be uh, from an unknown cause. And then of course, uh, certain viruses like Epstein-Barr virus and herpes simplex virus or mono and, and the old herpes virus, certain forms of hepatitis, uh, there's A, B, C, N, D. Not all of them are uh, severe, but any of these viruses that lurk around in the system can cause ongoing immune suppression because it's sort of like the police are con the police of your immune system are constantly at work, and that can cause long-term effects, including immune suppression, fatigue, and even potentially risk for autoimmunity. So it's important to identify these things uh, if there's suspicion of them and remove them. So those are all the many pieces for removing. Uh, if you're getting a lot of colds and flus or just want to optimize your immune system, those are things that you may want to consider. We're going to quickly move through hormones here. Uh, we already talked about stress. I view hormones as an orchestra, so we want all the hormones to play in harmony together. Uh, I already talked to stress ad nauseum. We want to have a good stress pattern where our cortisol is high in the morning and then tapers off as we go in the day. And if it's out of balance, that's something we want to balance out by reducing stresses, which we're talking about shortly. Thyroid is the master gland of the body. It sits right here in, in us gentlemen, just below the Adam's apple. And it is uh, what sets our body temperature and heats our body. It controls all other hormones to some degree. And is really impacted by things like heavy metals and high stress. So we want to make sure our thyroid health is really normal. Signs of a thyroid that's running low, which is usually where it goes if it's being tired, worn out, or, or not getting enough nutrients, is fatigue, weight gain, low mood or depression, although it can actually cause anxiety, particularly panicky anxiety, uh, or panicky quality of anxiety in it too, curiously. Um, but generally, everything just slows down. People tend to feel very sensitive to the cold. 
um, and things that help the thyroid are getting enough iodine, the mineral selenium, and tyrosine, which is which are one of our amino acids. Sex. Sex hormones. Yeah, baby, please. Austin Powers. I hear there's a new one coming out. I think that's happening. I have mixed feelings about that. Loved Austin Powers. And don't know if we need another one like the Bill and Ted movie, but that's just me. And weigh in later on that. Uh, sex hormones you want to keep in balance. Uh, again, I mentioned progesterone in particular can be helpful for sleep. And it's one, it's calming thing that particularly during the, the uh, women on this call is uh, think of estrogen simply as, as, as excess or too much estrogen is stimulating. It's too much. You get swelling. A lot of like PMS, classic PMS symptoms are because estrogen has spiked up uncontrolled by progesterone. So it's, you know, bloating, uh, cramping. It's just like too much, too much excess, estrogen excess. Whereas progesterone is calming, soothing. It's the counterbalancing. It really, it's about balancing the two is where optimal health occurs. But Progesterone is often what goes out of balance and uh, it is very calming to the nervous system. So it's something for if stress has been high or you're going into perimenopause or menopause, progesterone is usually one that needs to be balanced uh, with estrogen. Uh, and then DHA and testosterone are kind of cousins. They have, uh, you know, more important uh, testosterone in men because it's just, we make more of it, but it also plays a role in immune, all these play a role in immunity and mood. We want to have a good balance uh, in the hormones, which is just another, avenue to explore, but I would, you know, for hormones, I would start with stress and thyroid balance there because there's such controls. For sleep, our sleep hormone is called melatonin. Uh, and that's when we naturally repair our body when we're sleeping as we were talking about. And also we produce something else as a little side note here. Uh, if you've never heard this term, glutathione is generated best at night. So quality sleep not only means our immune system is going to do what work needs to do as well as repair and rebuild itself. And, but uh, which is why usually when we get sick, we feel tired, right? You get a flu and you want to sleep. It's a good thing, you know, like in the sense that our body's calling for a repair mode to go down, shut down, repair. But it's also when we produce glutathione and glutathione is the master antioxidant of the body. It helps restore things like vitamin C, vitamin E and other antioxidants. And it is so, so crucial. We see when glutathione is low that other disease states tend to get more serious or go out of control. Um, and uh, so it's something we want to make sure is repleted or stays high in our body. So we want to get good quality sleep. Uh, and melatonin is one of those things that does that. So if you're ever troubling falling asleep, you can actually supplement with melatonin. I wouldn't use it long term, not that it's harmful, but we want to ideally get you in your own natural biorhythm where you're producing your own melatonin. Melatonin, we all know what it feels like to have melatonin released. It's when you get that sleepy feeling right at nighttime, or if you have if you have bad sleep right now, if you remember it, uh, that's sort of like, oh, like that's melatonin being dropped in your system. It's like, oh, I just like your eyes feel heavy. You're ready to go to bed. Um, that is melatonin and it's a great antioxidant as well that repairs the body and supports the healing. So you want to get good sleep like that baby there. Sleep like a baby. And vitamin D question mark is a hormone. It's your fun fact for parties. It is not a vitamin. It was misnamed. Vitamin is kind of a weird category in itself, which is extraneous info you don't need to know. But uh, all our hormones are built out of cholesterol. They have a cholesterol backbone. So that's why cholesterol is not just all bad for us. We need a, a, the right amount to produce the right hormones. So uh, vitamin D is built out of cholesterol. It is actually the sunshine hormone, that's what I called it there, and the average Canadian levels are deficient. When you have an average of about 55, the adequate level of vitamin D occurs around 75, so you can see how that's problematic, and it plays a huge role in our immune system. It's, it's a, there was a, a recent study just over a year ago now, partly co-authored by the University of Calgary, showing that uh, getting in uh, higher amounts of vitamin D directly stimulates our immune system uh, through genetic expression. So it, it goes down to love of our DNA and says, get the immune system working. And so it activates it. So it's crucial. It has really important roles in bone health, mental health, uh, and mood. It's one of the reasons why we see more sad, sadness, melancholy, and depression in the winter or get seasonal affective disorder. It's partly because we're not getting the sunshine converting our D, vitamin D into its active form through our skin. And I would argue that unless you're a lifeguard or an avid nudist who's out during all those sunshiny days in the spring, uh, summer and warm fall days, you're unlikely reaching anything near optimal levels of vitamin D because I've tested, I've seen thousands of vitamin D levels and it's only through supplementation. So that's why even Health Canada very conservatively recommends a thousand IUs, which is usually a draw for one capsule of vitamin D a day. Uh, and I'll talk about dosing of that in a, in a moment here, but definitely I'm going to suggest something a little bit higher than that. 
So we want to optimize their vitamin D, not just get into a sufficient level. We want to get optimal. Optimal levels of vitamin D are more uh, in the 120 to 130 level, not just 75. So for anyone who's done their vitamin D, again, you want to get 120 to 130 is optimal. There's lots of emerging data showing that. Uh, and the thing I want to point out too is that this isn't a matter of opinion or just a bunch of NDs going, yeah, this is a good idea. Um, when we start talking, when I start talking about these things, these have uh, as much, you know, they're evidence-based as much as there's evidence for any of the remedies I'm, uh, I'm discussing. There is research studies and sometimes very robust ones, especially in like vitamin D that uh, saying this is, this is the way we want to do it. We want to have optimal levels by doing it this, by having these high levels. So let's talk about building a strong immune system. Finally, let's get into it. Instead of alluding to it, this is about prevention, right? We want to build the moat, the castle walls, get the castle guards up because we preferably we want to keep those colds, flus, sore throats away from us. We don't want to get them at all. And the next part we're going to focus on is, well, what if they get across the wall? Let's let's deal with that. But first, if we're just talking about prevention, if you're not sick right now, here's things you can do right now for this cold and flu season, especially COVID flu season uh, where you might want to boost your immunity. Um, and don't worry about, you know, if you want to screen capture that, go for that. If you don't have time to jot these down, I can certainly send these through the uh, through the foundation so you have a copy at home. So don't worry about writing down if you don't want. Vitamin A is an antiviral, it boosts our immune system, helps improve our gut lining and our skin health. Uh, and so it's super important. 10,000 I use a day with food. That's just usually one drop or one capsule of it. Um, very safe. And I would definitely take that as prevention. Uh, vitamin C, five, 500 milligrams or up to a gram twice a day with food or at any time is fine. It's really important for immune function. And then vitamin D, I'm suggesting anywhere from two to 5,000 I use daily. And do encourage you, if you've never had your vitamin D level tested, test it and then you know take a higher dose of vitamin D if you're not taking some already. Or, and then test it again in three months to four months to see where your level lies. Because the one thing here why there's such this range is I don't know what your actual absorption and use of vitamin D is and, until we give you some and, and measure it again. There are genetic factors playing a role there that we're starting to understand, but it's a little hard to predict. Um, body weight plays a role too here. It's one of those ridiculous things that to me that the, the, the Health Canada recommendation is to take a thousand I use of vitamin D, and which I get is just a low safe level, not to pick on them. But how does that make sense if you weigh 250 pounds versus if you weigh 105 pounds? So it's not taking into account body weight, which is always important thing to consider, especially with a fat soluble hormone like vitamin D. Minerals that are important for our immune system, zinc, selenium, and iron. Again, you can screen cap this or I'll send you the list. Some foods I want to point out here that you might see occurring in for zinc, selenium, and iron, pumpkin seeds, and spinach. i um, also a big fan of mushrooms, which I'll talk about medicinal mushrooms in a little bit. Um, iron, I don't recommend supplementing with, especially for men, um, <clears throat> unless you are anemic or have low levels. Uh, and even then, if it's only borderline low, start with the foods. If that doesn't get up, then using targeted iron supplementation as needed uh, is, a, is a good idea. Uh, generally, men don't need as much iron unless they have had an injury themselves, and it's usually a more uh, menstruating women who need more iron because they're menstruating still, um, but there's always exceptions to that. So iron, again, we're not boosting it. We just want to optimize so we're not anemic. Uh, and uh, selenium, the one thing I would like you to keep in mind, the, the richest source of selenium is Brazil nuts. You would get an adequate dose of Brazil uh, of, uh, of selenium by eating just three or four Brazil nuts a day, which is great. Nice, easy food to add in. So medicinal plants you can do to build up your immune system. Again, we're talking about prevention. This isn't if you've got a cold or flu right now. Astragalus isn't a Chinese herb. You can get the, it looks like sticks, these long brown sticks. You can get them um, for really cheap from Chinatown if you're feeling adventurous uh, or in a capsular powder. And uh, it is great at building immunity. It also has some proven scientific data to show it helps reduce cancer risk and has treat, can treat certain cancers. Um, as well, or be a, a complementary treatment to those. Echinacea is a wonderful herb. You can use it acutely too for colds or flus. I just wouldn't use it by itself. It, its indication is a bit more about building immunity and it's safe to take a lower level ongoing. Um, I've even heard one doctor, Dr. Kerry Bone, who's from Australia, who's a master herbalist and just a brilliant guy say that echinacea might be one of those fountain youth herbs. And he said it very reluctantly because it's such a goofy thing to say sometimes, um, but it is one you could take safely long-term. The only only time you'd have to be very cautious about echinacea, especially in bigger doses, is if you do have an autoimmune condition, it can, can be a little overstimulating and we don't want to aggravate an active 
thyroid flare or rheumatoid arthritis flare, for instance. And then fungus, you might be going, what the hell did he put fungus? Wasn't he talking about mold being bad earlier? Uh, I'll show you what I mean by that. It was just to get your attention. So are you paying attention? A couple of ways you can get some of these immune remedies. Uh, St. Francis, which is a, a Canadian company, you can get something called Deep Immune, which is a, you can take a ongoing to build your immunity. Uh, and then the picture there is echinacea flowers from Kelowna. They're a beautiful flower that uh, grows there. So fungus, I mean medicinal mushrooms. They're great to boost immunity. You can take them long-term safely. They have some antiviral activity, which is good these days, and helps adapt to stress and is nutrient rich. Well, that's a few boxes we checked. And if you're particularly stressed out, here's a few different types of medicinal mushrooms. Like reishi is very relaxing. I've had people don't do well with sleep medications like Zopiclone. They don't do well with some of the things that I recommend for sleep. And then reishi works for them. So it can be just that right, right remedy to calm the nervous system before bedtime. Um, it's not gonna put you to sleep if you take it during the day. It's a bit of an energy tonic, but it just helps accentuate the natural cycles of our body. If you're feeling really fatigued, then cordyceps mushroom would be good. Um, uh, and then there's a few other ones there too. And you can get combinations of them that are really great out there. Uh, I'm really a big fan of Purica, who I mentioned earlier, he used to uh, work for, because I think they make a really high quality uh, vitamin, uh, excuse me, a mushroom mix that is affordable and it's, they're in Canada, which is wonderful, like supporting local when they're making good quality things. Uh, otherwise I would go to a company like Host Defense, uh, which is Paul Stamets, who's a my, brilliant mycologist out of the US. Uh, and they also, I do like things like Harmonic Arts, which is from Upper Vancouver Island as well. Are we already talked about vitamin D? So we're just gonna power through that. So what if you do get a cold or flu? You're taking all those things, which hopefully still doesn't happen if you're taking all those good remedies, but if you're taking all those great immune remedies and you still happen to get, something gets past the council walls, you know, those won't make you bulletproof. I would, I, uh, I myself take immune remedies throughout cold and flu season and uh, having a toddler at home, I. Uh, have got more colds and flus, which is almost predictable uh, when you're getting uh, <laughs> the petri dish of your child coming home and all the things they're bringing back. Um, so uh, what happens? What do you do? Well, you want to change the approach a little bit. If you've been building up your immune system for, for, for prevention, then uh, your colds and flus should be milder and resolve more quickly. And I would take some of these other remedies again for vitamins, same remedies, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D, but increase the dose. Vitamin A, you can take up to 50,000 IUs a day. That's five capsules or drops typically for up to three days. You could take it longer too. Like if you're still sick, you can take it for up to a week. The only per thing I would caution, if you're a child, uh, if you're a woman of childbearing age, and uh, it, it can, vitamin A in that high dose can be mutagenic. Um, so you have to be really careful with it. You begin to bigger doses. Um, and certainly, even at 10,000 I use a day, you may want to consult your doctor or midwife um, if you are pregnant uh, about that dose. Um, but that's the one thing you want to be careful with. And then you can go back down to 10,000 for building normal uh, immunity. Otherwise, if I may, it's safe to take for the rest of us. Just again, if you're pregnant or thinking of getting pregnant or, or possibly getting pregnant, you just don't want to have big doses going through the system at that time. Vitamin C, you want to go up to a gram. Take it every two hours until you feel better. Not just twice a day, every two hours. Just keep taking it. It's so important for the immune system. It helps rebuild our glutathione which helps our immune system, which helps thin mucus. So we can clear if we're getting mucus in our sinuses and lungs. So get that vitamin C, it's inexpensive, easy, tastes nice in powders and tablets usually. And then vitamin D, um, I would go up to 10,000 I use, which is 10 drops a day. Um, and quite frankly, if it were me, if you were a patient, I might even go higher for up to three days, but 10,000 I use, I feel pretty safe saying, you, you know, can safely take for three days. It revs up the immune system um, and just starts to build those levels and then go back down to whatever your target dose is, but minimally 2,000 I use a day after that three day bump to the system. Minerals, again, we got zinc, selenium and iron. The dose is just bigger, it's about double. Again, iron is not something you're taking acutely, especially acute infection. You're already getting inflammation from the infection. Uh, too much iron can cause more inflammation. Um, so you don't want to take more, but you just want to maintain whatever levels you're taking and consider optimizing after you're feeling better uh, from your cold and flu. So it's, it's more of a factor just for mind to take up, keep in that dietary intake. You don't need to take more, but I just want to mention it as I mentioned the other two. Uh, the two rocks you see there are zinc in the upper right and selenium in the lower right. And one thing I didn't mention on the other page, which I alluded to, 
Um, you may have read what, uh, dosing for iron. I wrote QOD, which is Latin for take it every other day. There's now evidence showing that taking iron supplements, if you need to take them for anemia or because you don't absorb enough from your diet, taking it every other day, not every day, but every other day will improve absorption in the body, which seems counterintuitive, but that's what data shows us. And hey, lasts you twice as long. Pretty cool. Medicinal plants. There's lots of medicinal herbs you could take during infection. I've just chosen some of my favorites um, that are gonna be kind of you know a variety here and that are quite effective for cold and flu season. Golden seal is a herb that used to be endangered but now is being harvested uh, sustainably. Wonderful for anything that goes to the lungs or sinuses, it's a great mucus membrane tonic. And it's one you wanna take acutely. It tastes horrible, so bitter, um, but not most of these don't taste too amazing. Uh, oregano oil, which you may be familiar with. It's not one I personally use. I find this strong, tastes too strong for myself, even though I can tolerate some really strong taste, um, but very uh, profound uh, antibacterial and antiviral like golden seal. Licorice is more antiviral and immune supporting. It helps regulate stress, has some antibacterial effect. It's usually better in combination. And here, I put this picture jokingly. I don't actually mean licorice candy. There's not a therapeutic dose of licorice extract. It's the, the twiggy root there. Um, uh, again, licorice is not a taste that everyone loves, even the, the herbal kind. So it may not be the best for everyone. It's nice because it actually coats the throat as well. So if you can tolerate the taste, licorice tincture, um, or chew on extract can actually be coating and soothing if you got a sore throat. But uh, it also, like I say, regulates stress response in the body. So it can lower the stress, which is stressful being sick. And usually stress leads into sickness. I know that I've often, the few times I've had flus in my life, it's been the end of really stressful periods or the end of exam time when I was in school. And you're like, finally, I made it through and then crash. Why is that? Again, cortisol. The cortisol was high, suppressing immune function for a period of time out of balance because it's fight or flight mode, it's high. And then it goes down when you finally relax and then all the backlog of immune work starts occurring. So ahead of that, we want to building our immune system and regulating stress so we don't get that crash or the crash is much milder. And myrrh, I thought Christmas time coming, uh, the three wise men then center, they brought frankincense, myrrh and gold to the baby Jesus. And interesting is frankincense and myrrh are antimicrobial immune boosting herbs. Myrrh is a bit of a harder one to find. It tastes also really horrible, but uh, it's very effective. Again, for if you get a sinus infection or throat infection, it can be really great or great in combination remedy for kicking out an infection. It works great. Um, I imagine if you're limping in a dirty manger and early in the sea, having those scent in the air or otherwise is, is a sensible idea. And then I guess the goal was to buy, get down to the, the nice Hilton Hotel down the road. <laughs> um, the only named remedy here, not again, because I used to speak for Purica, but because it's hard to get anything equivalent that's so easy to take, is Purica's Prevail. It tastes nice. There's a kid's version here I've shown, although I literally give my son, even when he was, before he's one year old, the adult version, it tastes great. It's just three remedies combined together, one of them being honeysuckle, so it tastes nice. Very safe um, to take for anyone and coats the throat. It reduces viral infections. Uh, it stops viral proliferation or replication in the body. So it's great for any viral infections. It's anti-inflammatory. It has a little bit of antibacterial effect, but it's mainly for a virus. So if you're feeling like you're getting a cold or a flu, if you're mainly viral, Prevail is wonderful. They can even make uh, a claim showing that it reduces uh, the duration uh, of the common cold, which is a Health, Can Health Canada approved claim because it's so effective. And this comes out of studies done extensively in China where they used to give this same remedy in a sterile form intravenously. So this is a form almost as effective, if not as effective as the intravenous form due to a Canadian research company's 12 years of hard work and you can get it over the counter. Uh, it works like a hot dam. I keep it at home uh, for me and my family because it takes nice, easy to take, definitely add it in as something if you're getting a viral infection because it's so effective and affordable and easy to get. Um, uh, quercetin is from uh, an extract of from most fruits and vegetables, particularly if they're pale or green. Um, and uh, you just, you know, uh, uh, some really interesting research incurring with it right now. Uh, you can Google, Google it and uh, go check it out, but it has some antiviral effects and is a really potent antioxidant. Uh, Canadian research team went to Wuhan um, earlier this year uh, to present and, and investigate quercetin's usefulness. Um, so again, not making any claims to that, but you can go follow the research and see see what that tells you. But I certainly would add it in because I think it's a great remedy. It would be also indicated if you have digestive uh, upset or prone to allergies like hay fever, or a lot of stuffy noses, unrelated infection. It's really great at reducing histamine response. So allergic like reactions, or just if you have 
very upset stomachs or sore stomachs, it's very healing in that way as well. So it'd be a good choice. I wouldn't use it as a primary antiviral for anything, um, but I would put it in the mix uh, uh, this cold and flu season. And then glutathione, uh, best delivered intravenously. Uh, there are some fancy forms you can get absorbed under the tongue or the bloodstream. Um, but the cheapest way to get it is something called N-acetylcysteine or NAC, NEC. It's the building blocks of glutathione, that and some vitamin C. Uh, and it can be very effective. Again, not a primary antiviral antibacterial, but is a really important support player, especially this cold and flu season. Because you see um, people who tend to do worse with colds or flus tend to have depleted glutathione levels. Why is it depleted? You're not getting good nutrition like we talked about, you're not getting good sleep where it's regenerated, um, or you've been sick with other chronic illnesses that have depleted those levels, any kind of chronic ongoing illness, things like diabetes, uh, and, and, and lots more will deplete glutathione, so we need to really rev up intake and production. Whoo, almost there. Herbs and foods you have at home, and now let's get some question and answers. So here's some herbs and, cold, uh, and foods you have probably at home or could easily get at home for your cold and flus that you get. Garlic, wonderful. It's ginger, cinnamon, turmeric. Uh, garlic, best way to take it is to cut it up or mince it, leave it out for 10 to 15 minutes. It oxidizes it and that activates the active ingredient, which is called allicin. I always remember it in school as Aunt Allison comes for dinner, uh, but you want to chop up, dice up uh, the onion, the uh, garlic, leave it out, oxidize it, and you'll have way more antimicrobial effect, antibacterial, antiviral, and antifungal. So that's a great remedy. It's one of the world's arguably oldest antibiotics. Ginger, great uh, antimicrobial and really soothing to the digestive tract if you're getting an upset stomach or a stomach bug. Definitely add it into the mix. It has been shown to be very effective. And if you don't like the taste of ginger, you can certainly get capsules. Uh, or, or drink a tea if you don't mind it in that form. Cinnamon uh, has some antimicrobial effect and is quite soothing to digestive tract. It's really good um, for those people who have irregular blood sugar levels. So if you're tending towards diabetes or, or just have up and down uh, hungry all the time uh, and have had irregular blood sugar levels without any diagnosis, cinnamon is one teaspoon a day can help stabilize blood sugar levels. Plus it's a pretty easy thing to add in. The key is get true cinnamon or an active form of cinnamon, not um, some of the like cheap herb brands like McCormick's will just throw in um, a cheaper cinnamon tasting herb that is not uh, the, the actual act, medicinally active form of cinnamon. So it tastes like cinnamon, but it's not the actual medicinal form. So you want actual cassia cinnamon, which uh, harmonic arts, which is coming from uh, um, Vancouver Island. You could get, they literally call it true cinnamon. Just if you Google harmonic arts, you can order it directly to your door. Great company. That's where I get my sacks of cinnamon, I think, because it's such a fantastic herb and I like the flavor. And then turmeric, good on curries, but uh, it's a really great immune herb, it's warming, it's good for the liver. Um, and it's something that you may have in your kitchen. You can add to coconut milk or other healthy fat if you want and make golden milk. Uh, and then foods really quickly, because I know I ran a little longer than I said I would, uh, but colorful, eat colorful foods. I love Michael Pollan. He's a, 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 a written a few books. He's a university professor from the US and his advice is the best dietary advice that I could unpack for an hour, but we'll just say briefly, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Um, you know, eat a colorful rainbow of, of whole foods as much as possible. Don't add, you know, try and avoid refined flours and sugars. Like I said, if, if you need a chemistry degree to understand ingredients in your food, when you look on the back of the package, don't eat it. It's probably not great for you. Uh, and may, although it may not be harmful, it's not really something your body probably doesn't need. So we want to avoid additives and extra ingredients as much as possible and eat a wide variety of fruits and vegetables. Arguably, the reason we are so drawn to those bright colors is it's rich in antioxidants. And so uh, there is an interesting relationship there that we've had uh, with our body. And then seafood and uh, another good quality meats, uh, you know, like organic grass-fed red meat in, in moderation would be fine. Uh, and, uh, you know, poultry, although you may want to remove the skin to reduce some of the fat-soluble toxins in, in your poultry. So questions and answers. Uh, if I have more than five minutes or so worth of questions and answers. Now I can stay on longer or you can fire them off uh, for me to answer later. I'm happy to do that. If you want to get a hold of me, you can call this phone number right here. And uh, we're just, I'm in the process. Um, I didn't speak about where I practice because I'm in transition. I mainly work virtually right now. So if anyone wants to get on a consult or just do a free meet and greet sometime after today, you can just uh, 
call this number or email that email address and we can get set up for uh, like say a free 15 minute meet and greet or if you just want to dive in we can do an appointment happy to see you i work virtually especially during COVID times um, i do have a small home office on commercial drive drive um, and we'll be i'm, I'm working at uh, reopening a clinic uh, in the next few months as well so thank you everyone for your attention and do i have questions i think i gotta exit my screen here Shireen had left a few questions before she had to go. Um, I think yeah, one good. of them was, if you have low stomach acid, are you less immune to viruses and bad bacteria? That's a fantastic question. I'm just trying to see if I can see those questions too. You might be able to in chat um, if you open it up. Sorry there, everyone's getting other screens here. <laughs> Oh, I see it just collapsed the window. Hmm. Doesn't show questions, it just says names. I, you can I, just you, you can just read them to me for now, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, that's a great question. Stomach acid plays a big role. Consider it the moat of the castle. I didn't explicitly draw that line there, um, but we want a robust, healthy stomach acid because a bacteria and viruses die in it. This consider them like falling in the corrosive acid. It won't kill all of them, but it'll kill a significant amount as well improve our ability to break up food. So bacteria and viruses don't hitch a ride in undigested food. Uh, and, you know, if food isn't properly pulled apart by the stomach acid, um, it also puts more stress into the upper parts of our intestines, which can, as we talked about, cause inflammation, irritation, and immune dysregulation or, or aggravation through that. So having healthy stomach acid is super important. And the one thing I'll say, and it seems counterintuitive, but for anyone who is on stomach acid suppressing medications, um, like proton pump inhibitors or takes Tums regularly, you may not actually have low, uh, high stomach acid. It may actually be that you have low stomach acid, but you're producing too much of it. And the reason for that strange comment is that the signal that causes the door at the top of your stomach called the lower esophageal sphinc sphincter to close firmly and not allow acid or food to come back up is controlled by the strength of your stomach acid, pH, meaning the acidity. And so if you have weak acid, the door is actually floppy, whereas this normal strong acid closes it firmly. So a lot of reflux is actually caused by production of too much weak stomach acid um, would be something to explore. But yeah, it plays a crucial role. Yeah, and so thank you. And the last question she had was, what supplements might you recommend to support your hormones under stress? Awesome question. So it's supporting hormones under stress. It'll depend a little bit. The thing with naturopathic medicine is it's not like there's just one herb treats all. I will give some solid examples, but it would depend a little bit about who you are, what hormones need supporting, whether you're a man, woman, what part of your life cycle you're in, and really kind of who you are as an individual. Like if you're running more fatigued, uh, how active you are. So there's some different factors to make the best choice. Um, one of the remedies I did mention, medicinal mushrooms, are uh, adaptogenic and that they help regulate stress response. Particularly if you're really stressed out, then reishi mushroom would be good. <clears throat> Other stress regulating herbs are like are uh, which are good and, and generally can be taken by most people are ashwagandha. Uh, ashwagandha is a, a East Indian or Ayurvedic herb and uh, very gentle and safe. It helps boosts the hormone DHEA, which I did mention very briefly earlier, um, which plays some role in producing testosterone and progesterone in the body as well. Uh, another really safe herb uh, is rhodiola, which is a high mountain flower. Uh, and it's really boosting. It increases what's called VO2 max. So if you're active or doing exercise, it actually increases your lung capacity, your ability to uh, basically take in oxygen um, and it helps redu reduce anxiety. There's studies showing that it is, is both uh, lifts up adrenal uh, like energy, but also is a bit calming to the system. Uh, again, that's rhodiola. Um, uh, and then if you want something, that's, someone wants something that's a little bit more stimulating, uh, licorice can be a little bit more stimulating, which I mentioned as an immune herb earlier. Uh, and beyond that, although they're not immune herbs specifically, uh, the ginseng family, um, there's a few different ginsengs that are different levels of stimulating. Um, you know, something like American ginseng uh, is quite stimulating, whereas a Luthercoccus, which isn't really a true ginseng, uh, which, but is called Siberian ginseng, is a bit more 
mellow uh, and not quite as uplifting. So it depends how much of a boost you need. Thank you. Um, so another question came in through the Q&A function. And so, Excellent. Uh, I have, uh, excuse my pronunciation, I have hypoaldosteronism. So I have mm. trouble controlling BP. Are there things you could recommend I do to help this condition? Great question. It's a little hard to off the cuff that one. So uh, one of their, uh, one of the hormones, aldosterone is uh, hypo, you said, correct? Low? Hypo. Uh, yeah, hypoaldosteronism. Yeah, it runs low. So it's just something because, you know, we don't have to be careful about moderating. Uh, it's that, you know, so, so while you might benefit from something like licorice, because it actually does help increase blood pressure a little bit, we'd want to be careful with licorice too. So we want to do that, you know, we do that with supervision of someone who's just monitoring that closely. Most herbs, um, uh, herbs that affect um, aldosterone and the like blood pressure and adrenal system um, don't have that strong an effect on blood pressure. And even licorice, to be fair, is is only usually a concern with someone who already has a pre significant pre-existing condition or has very high blood pressure. But still, we want to be careful because could be anyone could be sensitive to any herb or any medication. So we want to proceed cautiously when there's any any reason to be. Um, so I would certainly, in that kind of condition, use um, supporting players to the adrenal glands. And what I mean by that is you want to get all the minerals, you know, certainly things like selenium and zinc that I mentioned earlier into optimal levels. Make sure thyroid is functioning optimally because the thyroid is like, is, is controls all, all hormone systems or has a major role in controlling all hormone systems in the body. Uh, and then looking at what your stress response is, what your energy is, during the, is doing throughout the day, and then making sure that's regulated so that energy is stable or good throughout, and preferably good to optimal during the day. And then sleep is, is optimal because those will all play a role in, in regulating hormonal balance. Um, and I would certainly for, the, for, for that I would go to um, herbs more like uh, the medicinal mushrooms, um, like reishi, um, or a, a combination of them, and, uh, and ashwagandha would be a, a good herb to get in the mix too, is re regulating that that system. Um, but otherwise, for a more comprehensive um, look into that, you know, I'd need to see more labs and what that specific case is. But, but thank and thank you for asking that question. Hopefully, yeah. some of those things were helpful recommendations for you, or will be. Um, and so the next question, um, there's three right now, but uh, so I'll just read them out. So if you are trying to conceive, what foods would you recommend a woman take? I love that question. Um, I, I love, I'm very excited about babies. Um, <laughs> ah, and to be clear, I'm, I, I have one, I have my son at home, he's, he's three now, but uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, babies. Uh, I don't know if I want to go through the sleep debt of one, so I'll honor you for having one soon. Um, yeah, so what nutrition do you take before? The key things for, for pregnancy are uh, you want to get, first and foremost, all your vitamins and minerals in place. So, uh, you know, do, do hedge your bet by getting a good prenatal multivitamin. It's just considered a, a insurance policy. And then, you know, eating... Uh, a, you know, lots of plant foods, you know, getting about six to eight servings of plant foods as colorful as possible, which is a little harder in the winter, but uh, you want to have a bright, colorful rainbow of naturally occurring foods as much as possible. And uh, then getting enough omega-3 fatty acids is so crucial for you and the baby uh, because uh, you are wiring another human being's nervous system and omega-3 fatty acids are what play uh, a major role in, in, in insulating and, and producing some of that wiring. Uh, I remember, Dr. Tierna Lodog, who's um, this uh, senior M integrative MD in the U.S., gave this talk, and that was she was sort of reflecting, uh, you know, how uh, her kids needed glasses, and she wondered if it was because her actually her omega when her first child needed glasses, the second didn't, and she wondered in retrospect if it was because her omega three intake was too low at that time, and she just didn't know and was living on the poor as a her early days as a doctor and, and then the new mom. So getting those omega threes. Uh, in, in a three to four gram dose daily uh, is really important. If you're vegan, uh, then getting them through walnuts, hemp, hemp hearts, uh, hemp oil, flax, ground flax seeds or flax oil would be the most abundant ways, but you wanna get significantly more because it's harder for us to convert. Oh, anyway, here, fell down. earthquake, earthquake occurred, interesting. That was 
dramatic. Get them down. That's true. Um, you want to get some more of them in if you're getting vegetarian sources or you can mix and match, but uh, getting those omega-3s is super important. Getting the vitamins and minerals from a multivitamin, um, you know, and then, uh, you, you know, foods to avoid too. You want to be cautious with, uh, you know, raw fish, which my wife was uh, struggled with. She loves sushi. Uh, is something you want to avoid just because possible bacteria um, and technically raw honey and other raw foods. Although if it's something you've been eating and you have a stable source of the honey, you're probably okay with that. Yeah. Okay. And so the last question here on the Q&A function is uh, what kind of foods help women with menstrual cramps? Ooh, great question. Well, menstrual cramps are usually caused by, again, EXE or excess. Estrogen is too much. So it's too much, too much blood flow, too much blood not moving the way it's supposed to, too much estrogen. So the answer therein lies the foods that help clear estrogens out of the system, which are your cruciferous vegetables primarily, broccoli, bok choy, cabbage, cauliflower. You want to get a cup of them or more daily. Um, and if you don't love eating those every day, you could do what I do. I literally blend like a cup of bok choy into my smoothie every day and with some berries, fruit, and a vegan protein, and it tastes delicious. I don't notice it. Um, but they contain something, uh, a few different active ingredients that help clear estrogen metabolites out of the body. So really, really important to get your cruciferous vegetables. Um, flax also can be very useful. Flax oil or flax, ground flax seeds uh, help clear estrogens out of the system. Uh, and although it's a little bit of a hot topic that requires some unpacking, but uh, soy can, again, I would only eat organic soy, organic soy. Um, but, but even though it is technically a high in plant estrogen food, it, it's, it's estrogen, the plant estrogen in the soy is weaker than, our, than, than your estrogen. So it'll help block inappropriate extra estrogen. Again, the key thing is, um, you know, I wouldn't have it every meal, every meal of every day, but a good organic source, you know, three to five servings a week. Um, and certainly if you're getting cramps, you can have more during those days would be a good way to go. And, and it's a great way to get a fermented food like tempeh in, right? Where you can get some good bacteria and some some uh, some great soy food in. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, one just popped up. Um, I heard eating a banana a day, uh, sorry, I heard eating a banana a day during your period helps with cramps. What are your thoughts? Um, if you're low in potassium, potentially, although bananas aren't the only good source of potassium. I mean, green leafy vegetables are really rich in potassium. Spinach is rich in potassium and iron, uh, which you lose during menstruation. Um, not to pick on bananas. I often have a, around a banana a day and tend to put it as a sweetener in my smoothie. Um, so yeah, if you're low in potassium, if you're sweating a lot uh, or not just getting other good food sources of potassium, you could try a banana a day, but I would also add green leafies. I would also add some cruciferous vegetables into the mix because of the aforementioned reasons. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, but I have no problem with bananas. Some people poo-poo them because they're like, they're too high in sugar. I'm like, com what, compared to a cookie? No. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't eat 10 bananas a day if that's your only fruit or vegetable, but uh, having one or two a day along with other fruits, vegetables, healthy fats and proteins, excellent. Go for it. Well, thank you. Um, that's all the questions here. If anybody would like to ask a question via audio, um, I guess, please feel free. If you feel um, brave. One thing I'll say more about the cramps and bananas, um, not about bananas specifically, but ginger, although I mentioned as a digestive cramping remedy, uh, actually can help uh, with uh, menstrual cramping to some degree as well, because it's anti-inflammatory and it's, it helps reduce muscle spasming in the body. So. I uh, got some ginger, a ginger banana, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, good smoothie. Yeah, absolutely. I, sometimes I add powdered ginger into, and vanilla protein powder into mine. It's quite nice. All right. Well, if any qu burning questions occur to anyone here or you just didn't feel comfortable asking them, uh, you have an email address there. To be clear, that is my uh, administrative email address. So um, if you don't want any other eyes but mine seeing that, you could just say, I have a question for Dr. Callis. Please forward it to him. And then and I would reply from my own personal email there. Um, but if you don't mind uh, in confidence, uh, the eyes of my administrator seeing it forwarding it to me, then fire it off there. But that's, that's the contact place. And I am on Facebook sporadically. So please 
don't message me there if you want an answer quickly. Um, I, I'm on Instagram a little bit more regularly uh, under Dr. Patty. Thanks everyone for joining me. Hopefully this is helpful and we boost up our immune systems, clear out any colds or flus you are experiencing and, uh, and or reduce the, the likelihood or severity if you do get them. And if there's anything I can do for you, like I said, please feel free to contact me. Happy to help. And I look forward to seeing whoever's gonna join me next Friday at 1 p.m. for our talk on stress and anxiety. So if you want to know more about how to regulate stress response and specifically anxiety, uh, then join me next week.